In 1907, John Frederick Herbe, an Acadian jeweler, author, optometrist, politician, historian, and promoter of Acadian heritage, bought 14 acres of land in Grand Pre, Nova Scotia, Canada, on which to build a memorial park. Herbe chose the site because he believed that the Church of St. Charles de Maine had stood there, a site of significance to the Acadian deportation out of Grand Pre in the mid-18th century. Herbe built a stone cross to mark the site of the church cemetery, now called the Herbe Cross, using stones from foundations excavated on site. In 1917, Herbe sold the land to the Dominion Atlantic Railway, who took over his vision of establishing a memorial park, with the stipulation that the location of the original church was to be left to the Acadians. The park, located beside the railway's main line, was expected to draw American tourists to Nova Scotia, and so the railway invested in developing the site and promoting Acadian history and lore in the gardens, as well as in a small museum. In 1920, a statue of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Acadian heroine, Evangeline, was erected at the center of the park. In 1922, the memorial church was built, though the interior was not complete until 1930, when it opened as a museum. The Canadian government bought the site in 1957, and Parks Canada took on its operation. In 1982, it was designated a National Historic Site, and in 2012, the site was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Today, Parks Canada invites visitors to immerse themselves in a powerful monument that unites the Acadian people and uncover the tale of Le Grand Rangement through engaging multimedia. They describe Grand Pre as the most significant memorial to the Acadians' tragic upheaval that visitors can experience by admiring the statue of Evangeline and by viewing their collection of impressive artifacts and statues, which are storytellers of this turbulent history. Today on History in Austria, we're walking through the UNESCO World Heritage Site at Grand Pre, Nova Scotia, to experience the Acadian history on site. Coming into Grand Pre, guests begin their visit in the Visitor Center, which houses a sizable museum exhibit, gift shop, and display space. When we were visiting, the space was being used to display submissions to an Evangeline coloring contest. After purchasing our day passes, we made our way outside. The path leading out from the visitor center is dotted with statues and panels. The first statue we encountered monumentalizes the Acadian deportation. Continuing down the trail, we passed a few panels before coming to an old rail line. A statue of Evangeline greets visitors as they come into the main park area, and the memorial church stands behind her. The trail to the church is crossed by another, which leads on the right to the Air Bay Cross, Statue of Longfellow, and a grove of willows dated to the period of Acadian occupation, and on the left, a small apple orchard, blacksmith shed, and kitchen garden. The rest of the site is designed as a fairly open park, including a rather algae-infested pond and lots of green space. Most of the historical interpretation on site is presented in the Visitor Center and Memorial Church. The interpretation in the church focuses on Le Grand Derangement, whereas the exhibit in the visitor center gives a broader history of the Acadians. Acadians are descendants of the French-speaking people who settled in northeastern North America, roughly the modern Canadian provinces in northern Maine. This region, called Acadia, was ceded from France to Britain in 1713 under the Treaty of Utrecht, without, of course, the consent of local indigenous peoples who had not ceded this land, but that's a topic for a different video. In the 1950s, the French and British were at war again in what we now call the Seven Years' War, a conflict that occurred on North American soil between 1754 and 1763, and that most Americans refer to as the French and Indian War. During this war, the British forcefully deported the Acadians, mainly to other British-held territories, like the Thirteen Colonies. It's estimated that between 10 and 15,000 Acadians in this region were deported. This diaspora is a significant part of Acadian identity and history, and Grand Pre was the first Acadian community to be deported. On Friday the 5th of September, 1755, Colonel John Winslow ordered all males of 10 years or older to gather in the Grand Pre Church for an important message from His Excellency Charles Lawrence, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia. The decree stated that, Your land and tenements, cattle of all kinds and livestock of all sorts, are forfeited to the crown, with all other of your effects, savings, your money, and household goods, and you yourselves to be removed from this province. 
At Grand Pre, this narrative is depicted through a series of paintings in the memorial church. However, this is not the site's primary focus. Rather, the memorial garden is centered around the statue of Evangeline that was erected in 1920. Her image is integral to the symbolism at Grand Pre and of Le Grand Derangement in general. Evangeline is a fictional character, created by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in a poem named for her. Longfellow, a New Englander, wrote the poem in 1847. The poem follows the story of the Acadian deportation through the character of Evangeline, who is separated from her lover, Gabrielle, during the expulsion. As Naomi Griffiths writes, The essence of Evangeline is the history of the Acadians, what Longfellow saw as a simple, devout, prosperous people whose community was unwarrantedly and brutally destroyed by the English. This disaster was accepted by Longfellow's Acadians with stoic calm, Christian fortitude, and resignation. By far, the greater part of the poem centers upon the fate of the community, and it is the last sections alone that turn upon the destiny of Evangeline and Gabrielle. After wandering across the continent in search of her true love, Evangeline meets him on his deathbed. Shortly after the poem's publication, Evangeline was taken up as an Acadian icon. Evangeline's statue was erected in Grand Pre primarily because Longfellow's poem made the village a tourist attraction for Americans, who came here wanting to see Evangeline's homeland. The poem has had a massive influence on the ways in which Acadian history is taught, as well as on the physical landscape of the Annapolis Valley and Grand Pre. For example, we took Evangeline's trail to get to the historic site, and the village and surrounding area are dotted with a ton of shops and cafes that are named for her. During our visit, we wondered about whether this historic site's use of her imagery is a little outdated, and about the impacts of this character, written by a non-Acadian poet, on Acadian identity. I'm not an expert in Acadian history or the history of Grand Pre, so to answer these questions, I talked to someone who is. I'll let her introduce herself. My name is Stephanie Pettigrew. I'm a PhD candidate at UNB Fredericton. Um, I study the colonial history of New France and Acadia, and I also teach the history of Acadia. And uh, I happen to be Acadian, <laughs> Cape Breton, so uh, I've sort of been steeped in this from childhood. Stephanie and I talked about the National Historic Site at Grand Pre, but our chat focused largely on Evangeline and the reasons that this fictional character has come to predominate the history of Acadia and Le Grand Derangement. First, I asked her why she thought Evangeline was so predominant at this UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yeah, well, I think that um, there, there's a couple of reasons why Evangeline is there. Um, when they create that, that, uh, that site, um, I don't think that there was a very much actual Acadian history that was very well known. Um, so Evangeline was a very easy figure to to focus on. Um, she was very popular already. Um, people could could grasp that history without really having to educate people on why that statue was there or, or who she was. Um, and it was you know a romantic figure that uh, that that people could could really tell the story easily. The, um, the, the poem was written and became very popular around the end of the 19th century, which really coincides with the beginning of the Acadian Renaissance. So there's a, drink, there's a direct link to be drawn there between the popularity of Longfellow's poem and Evangeline and Gabriella's characters, um, and all of a sudden people becoming cognizant of the story and history of the Acadians. Um, so I, I don't mean to in any way say that we don't owe a great debt as, a, as Acadians to Longfellow and, and the popularization of the poem and Evangeline. Um, but Evangeline as a character became very much the embodiment of what people sought as the, um, the ideal Acadian woman. So for a hundred years, we saw the projection of the ideal Acadian woman as being patient, um, as being quiet and religious and Catholic and um, pursuing family above all else, um, and always looking after, looking out for that 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 one person, her Gabrielle, um, and pr patiently pursuing her Gabrielle. 
um, and always submitting to all the harshness that that came her way and never fighting back and just that that became a large part of Acadian identity and it was internalized um, so completely that it took 100 years really for Acadians to start fighting back in the 1960s and start really fighting for in earnest for for language rights for education rights um, and start making noise um, because for the longest time the the a, a, a big part of Acadian identity was to just you know just keep quiet just don't fight back just keep quiet um, and a lot of that can be traced back to the story of Evangeline and Gabriel because if you keep quiet and you just submit to these hardships then eventually you'll be rewarded. And so that, that's some of the problematic elements of having adopted Evangeline as a national symbol. I also wondered if, given the chance to redesign the space, if Stephanie would remove Evangeline from Grand Prix. I, I, I would say that taking down Evangeline at this point would be as problematic as leaving her up, um, just because she does serve as that entry point for so many people. And and like I said earlier, it's it she it, she does have that legacy of of um, ushering in the, the sort of new age of nationalism for for the Acadian community itself. Um, if it wasn't for Longfellow's poem, um, it who who knows how long it would have taken for people outside of the Maritimes to become aware of this history. It's it's really Longfellow that brought this history to light. So. Kudos to him, um, but yeah, I would I would definitely add to that tradition um, by uh, adding a lot more about the women who were actually at Grand Prix, the real ones as opposed to the fake ones, um, and uh, talking a lot more about uh, their legacy and how they survived and the actions that they took because a lot of them were not docile at all um jean like for example uh jean Duga, who's one of my ancestors um traveled all over the maritimes in an attempt to avoid the deportation she went from Louisbourg to uh fredericton to miramichi to vestigush and her brother was a pirate who attacked the uh british at the battle of vestigush and then she and her husband were in Halifax fighting to get their land back in 1763. So this is this is not a docile history. This is a history of fighting back and, and trying to maintain their rights. And I, I think that that is a that's the type of history that we need to start talking about. Um, because the, although Evangeline does serve a purpose, it's it's important, especially for women. To, to see this this history of we served a role. We served an important role and we had actual heroines in, in this history that were really important and had great histories and great stories. Um, and we need to we need to do a better job of disseminating those stories. The historic site at Grand Prix consists mostly of a memorial garden and church which are complemented by a more traditional museum exhibit housed in the visitor center, while guests can get a more complex history of the Acadian village at Grand Prix in the visitor center. The site's true history is somewhat overshadowed by the image of Evangeline, at the expense of de-emphasizing the actual physical remains of the Acadian village, mainly the Abwato. Abwato, the Acadian term for dikes, were a significant part of Acadian life at Grand Prix, and a reason that this land was so desirable to the Protestant planters Britain gave Acadian land away to after the expulsion. Abwato were used to reclaim land from the Minas Bay. Once desalinated, the reclaimed land was ideal for farming and continues to be used to this day. Visitors can get a view over the marshlands from the landscape of Grand Prix Lookout Point that also looks over the historic site. These fields are privately owned, and the public is not permitted to drive on the dikes, but curious visitors can walk along the roads by foot. In addition, there are some other sites guests can drop by at other locations near the original village, 
including at Horton's Landing, which was intended as a planter settlement. These sites offer a little more detail about the history of this place, as well as some great views over the Minas Bay, but are largely focused on the landscape and post-1755 history. Most of the history at Grand Pre is represented in the Visitor Center Museum and Memorial Church. The rest of the site functions as a memorial garden, with few of the components visitors might expect at a historic site, save a few interpretive panels and plaques. This seems to be the legacy of John Frederick Herbe, who sought to create a memorial to the Acadians, not a heritage site, and of the changes made by the Dominion Atlantic Railway to try to draw in more American tourists who came to Grand Prix knowing little about the site outside of what's said in Longfellow's poem. This kind of memorial garden isn't inherently bad, but there are certain things that Parks Canada could do to improve the educational value of this heritage site. Stephanie had a few thoughts about what could be done. I see far too many instances of the deportation being discussed just in terms of Grand Prix in 1755. So I, when I teach it and when I talk about it, I, I try to emphasize that this wasn't just one event that happened in one place. This was a, a series of disruptions and a series of events that included forced deportations that include a huge refugee movement um, that included voluntary deportations um, or movements. Um, once, uh, you know, there was projects like um, uh, Acadians who ended up in France and the state tried to resettle them. That was a voluntary movement on the part of the Acadians. Um, th this was a massive, massive event that took 20 years to, to really settle down. So that, that's what I try to emphasize when I talk about the deportation, is that this wasn't just 1755, and it wasn't just Grand Prix. This was pretty much the entire Atlantic world, and it was, it was really a significant event over multiple years. Ultimately, Grand Prix as a historic site is a testament to the influence Longfellow's Evangeline had on public interest in Acadian history and the history of Le Grand Derangement. In the century since the site was established, we've learned a great deal about the Acadians that complicate the ideas Longfellow projected. Acadians were not simple peasant farmers. They resisted British rule and expulsion from their homelands. They were involved in an Atlantic-wide trade economy and had connections in New England, Quebec, and Europe. The deportations of Grand Prairie in 1755 had an Atlantic-wide impact and one that is not well represented in the current Memorial Park. However, as we've learned more about the Acadians, the Visitor Center Museum has incorporated some of these narratives for guests who take the time to read through their exhibit. We hope that, soon, Grand Pre will incorporate some of these elements in the outdoor portions of the site as well. Footage from my trip down to Grand Pre is courtesy of Graham Christie, and special thanks to Stephanie Pettigrew. Our theme music is by Brooke for Free. You can learn more at brookeforfree.bandcamp.com.